uh, uh, we're going to be looking at four different systems for composting materials at home. Um, and those are going to include uh, uh, turning and holding systems, uh, mulching, and a wormery. And I've got to get out of here for just a second. Here. Oops. No, I can't. Sorry, folks, I've got to get rid of this thing. You probably see this, this meeting being recorded right in the middle of the screen. I can't get out of here. It's okay, Craig, we can't see that. That's just on your screen. Okay, but I, then I can't see what I'm doing either, so. Oh, sorry. Um, and I can't get out of here, so this is not good. Okay, so I'm going to have to just go with it here um, in, in terms of this big notice in the middle of my screen. But anyway, we're going to be looking at the various systems available and explaining how the systems work. We're going to be looking at mulch, how to make it, how to use it, how to set up and use a wormery. And we're going to look at uh, how to use compost around your home. And we're going to finish with some troubleshooting and sort of the difference between peat and compost, because that is the theme of the night. Okay, so composting in its most simple form is the farming of aerobic microbes to promote the decay of biodegradable materials to, call, to create a stable humus-like substance called compost. Now that's as technical as I'm gonna to get tonight. And what I wanna do is break this down is that uh, we're using uh, air-loving microbes, which are tiny forms of life, single cell organisms, to degrade biodegradable materials, which are anything that was once living uh, into uh, a compost product, okay? So um, this is a biological process, right? And we are farming. So basically um, we can think of this as, uh, as raising anything else, uh, livestock, chickens, cats, pets, dogs, children even. They need a balanced diet and they need air and water, just like all of us. But we see from this, this, this picture here, uh, the food web of the compost pile, is that there are many organisms involved with composting. We start out with the organic residuals or biodegradable wastes in the lower right-hand corner, and there's the first level of consumers, which are the different organisms that feed directly on the materials, whether they're landscape and garden materials or food from the kitchen. Um, and the primary actor here is the bacteria. And these are aerobic bacteria, bacteria that like to live in the presence of oxygen. We also see that there are molds and fungi and actinomycetes and also different worms that like to consume this organic material. Then there's another second degree or second level consumers that actually eat the first degree uh, consumers. And these consist of springtails and mites and flatworms and other organisms. And then there's the third level of consumers, which are the beetles and the centipedes and different mites and ants. It's kind of like the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the rabbits eat the food or the, the, the grass and then the foxes eat the rabbits. You saw, so there is an ecosystem. It's just something that we don't and sometimes cannot see very well. But the important thing here is that all these organisms have a role to play in the composting process. So we might start with the bacteria, they, they easily consume some of the materials, and then later on other materials come in and help finish the composting off. So if you see these, these, these critters in your compost pile, they're there for a reason, and they are helping to break material down and turn it into a lovely compost product. Now, there's, that covers the biology, the biology, because we are managing a biological process. And as I said earlier, that basically composting is farming. And if we can kind of take this farming mentality, then we understand that if we're gonna raise cattle or we're going to uh, raise pets or even children, they need a balanced diet and they need air and water, okay? So the first thing we need to do is give them a balanced diet of green brown materials, okay? And we're gonna show you materials that can and shouldn't be composted as well as sort of what are green and what are brown materials, okay? And the second thing is really that uh, uh, important thing is the particle size. It, because the smaller the particle, the faster it's gonna decay because compost ha composting happens from the outside in, 
all right? Now the most, and, and then really this is the point is that basically if you had a block of ice and you put it into the sun, it would take all day to melt. But if you took a hammer and broke that piece of ice up into smaller pieces and spread it out, it would take an hour to, to melt it. And this is the same thing with composting. Composting, we're working from the surface. So the more surface area there is, the more opportunity there is for the bacteria and other organisms to work on the material and break it down. Now, the second, the third thing that's important here is moisture. All life needs moisture to, to survive and thrive. And the, 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 if you can imagine that the composting organisms live in the film of moisture that surrounds the particles, then that helps to make the compost happen. So without that moisture, composting stops. So a lot of times, and I was just out in Rangecon County Wicklow today, and we had opened up these plastic composters that have been sitting in the sun and all the materials were dried out. And I asked, how long were they there? And they said, well, this stuff has been here in here for years. Well, it's because there wasn't that media for the bacteria to live in and actually do the composting work. It was all dry and nothing happens if, it, if they don't have the moisture. The other thing is aeration. And it's important because what we're trying to promote here is aerobic bacteria, those that like to live in the presence of oxygen. Because there's two types of bacteria that are going to be used to degrade things. One likes to live in the presence of oxygen and one likes to live in uh, without oxygen. Now, these anaerobic bacteria are the ones that don't like to live without oxygen, live in our gut, all right? So when we digest food in our gut, we produce a solid waste, we produce energy from the food and we produce gas, okay? And that's the difference between aerobic and anaerobic digestion or aerobic composting, anaerobic digestion, is that when we compost, we're producing carbon dioxide and heat and water vapor, where with anaerobic digestion, we're producing a gas, okay? Now, if we can capture that gas, and we do in the sewage treatment plants and in anaerobic digesters that are taking different forms of waste in the country, we can capture that gas and generate electricity out of it. So it can be beneficial. But if we bury it in a landfill, that gas can escape into the atmosphere and, and contribute to global warming. Now, the fifth essential really is the sort of what I call the critical mass, which is the size of the compost pile. We have to have a certain mass of materials in order to sustain the process. If your pile is too small or too flat, it could dry out in the summer or get too wet in the winter. If the pile is big enough and we've done the right mixture of materials and given it the moisture and cut it up, we can get a nice heat out of that that can kill pathogens and weed seeds. So if we have that critical mass of material, that compost pile will stay nice and hot. Okay. Now, now we got a problem. Now I can't switch the slides, right? And I can't stop the share either. I'm gonna stop your share. Are you okay? You're on to green brown material. Yeah, stop the share so I can get rid of this thing in the middle if you could, please. Yeah, yeah. No worries. There we go. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate right. it. Okay. So here we're back and we're going to talk about the types of materials we can use for composting. And basically we divide it up into green materials that are wet and high in nitrogen and brown materials that are, uh, that are, that are brown and are full of carbon. And Craig, the, Craig, sorry. Can you share again there, please? Sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Sharing. Just a minute. See, let's go back. I'm, I'm very sorry. Thank you for reminding me, Sinead. Okay, now how do we go back? Okay. All right. Can everybody see? All right. So basically, the, mater the materials we're using for composting are divided into two categories. They're green materials and they're brown materials. Green materials contain nitrogen, essential for the creation of protein and microbe reproduction, and brown materials contain carbon, which provides the energy for microbe growth. It's kind of like meat and potatoes in our diet. The potatoes provide energy and the protein provides a, a nice balanced diet. Now, an ideal mix is actually getting half grass and half leaves, and that gives us an ideal mix of materials for making good compost. But most materials, as we'll see shortly, 
are well balanced on their own and don't need to be balanced. So we're gonna go through that in just a minute. Here's a list of materials that we can and shouldn't compost. And this is gonna take just a little while to get through the list, but it is important because my theory here is rubbish in is rubbish out. If we put bad things into the compost, we're gonna get a low quality compost that are full of weed seeds or diseases or any of this other stuff. So we need to be conscious about what goes into the compost system. Now we can compost grass cuttings, although they're difficult to manage, but I'm gonna teach you how to, to, to manage them. We can do leaves and annual weeds, flowers, old flower plants, old vegetable plants, old, old uh, household plants, bush and tree trimmings, hay and straw, veg, vegetative food scraps, which is fruit peelings and, and vegetable scraps. Rinse seaweed is a, a good addition to either your compost pile or your garden soil. Cattle manure, especially from the cows and horses and, 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 and sheep, as long as they're vegetarian. And again, vegetarian pet poop, rabbits, gerbils, guinea pigs, hamsters, you name it. Um, shredded paper products. Now I'm not a huge fan of adding paper to the pile, but if that's the only brown material you have, then they'll add a work. Paper napkins and towels. And again, the stuff needs to be torn up and shredded up a little bit. Sawdust and wood shavings, as long as it's not from treated wood and pine needles and pine cones. All right, the no-no list. The no-no list is no disease plants because there, there's a potential if you're doing a cold and slow compost pile that those disease spores or disease can persist and be spread back out into your garden. And then there's the perennial weeds. And perennial weeds are those weeds that spread by root, okay? Where annual weeds spread by seed. Okay, so perennial weeds in Ireland, our, our favorite ones are bindweed, briars, ivy, scutch grass. Now we can cut the scutch grass and use the tops, but we don't want to put the roots of the scutch grass into the pile. All right, so again, if we put these perennial weeds, especially the roots, into the compost pile, they can survive. And then when we use the compost, we're just spreading those weeds back into our garden bed. Now we know things like ivy or briars, even the stems will convert into roots. And so those need to be kept out. Now you can add them to your compost pile if you dry them out completely, and then they can be chopped up and added to the pile. Now the same thing with weeds. The seeds can survive the process. If you're making a hot pile, it'll kill the weed seeds, but most of us will not have enough material to make a big, huge batch of compost. So what I suggest all good gardeners would do is to pull the weeds before they go to seed, all right? Now, if you've got dandelions, which is a great material for composting, you can actually uh, pull that weed out and it has a big taproot on it. So if that dandelion has flowered and you put the whole weed into your compost pile, the energy from the taproot is going to then turn that flower into seed. So what do you do? You want the dandelions because they have great uh, micronutrients in the root. You pop the top, take off the, the top or the flower of the dandelion, and then you can put them both into the compost pile, okay? So cut, cut the flower off from its energy source. Now we can want to keep out the carnivore pet poop, which is the cat and the doggy do. All right, doggy do can go down the, down the toilet or it can be buried in, in, in uh, non uh, food producing areas of the garden, or you can get a green cone to do your dog do. And uh, cat poo needs to be probably put into the black bin with its cat lid. We want to also keep out any animal derived food scraps such as meat, bones, skins, or eggshells just because these can attract our furry fella friends and uh, flies and maggots and it can smell. So basically we are, our piles are vegetarian, okay? So that, and that is the same that goes for dairy products, no grease or cooking oil, that'll kind of put a different coating onto the materials and they won't break down. And lastly, but not least is we don't want any ashes from the barbecue fireplace stove, especially coal ashes, which can have heavy metals. Now, the reason I don't like to put ashes in the compost pile is that it is very alkaline, all right? It'll upset the balance of the a, a pH balance of the pile. The other reason I don't like ashes is that because they, they're so fine, they'll take up airspace in the pile 
and, and it can suffocate the pile. Now, if you have a, a, a cupful, fine, no problem. Spread the ashes on the pile, but I don't want to see people adding buckets of ashes onto their compost. Now, if you have acidic soil and you want to remedy it, keep the ashes separate and then incorporate it directly into the soil. All right, so there are, there are things to do and with, with, with your ashes, all right? Okay, here's some examples of green materials here quickly is we have grass clippings, annual weeds, old flowers, uh, veg vegetative food scraps, vegetarian pet poo. Those are all, all uh, examples of materials that are high, uh, that are green and high in nitrogen. And the, 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 the brown materials are leaves, uh, hay, straw, pine needles, shredded paper. Um, anything that really looks brown is generally high in carbon, except there's always an exception to the rule here, is that dog dew and cow poo and all the other poos are brown, but they're high in nitrogen. So the trick is if it smells either fresh or as it decomposes, it's probably high in nitrogen. Just like when we try to compost grass all by itself, it can mat, get gooey and get stinky. It's very high in nitrogen. Okay, so the things that are well balanced in terms of ready to go, compost as is, is a common, is a uh, autumn lawn clippings with both grass and leaves in it, bush or tree trimmings, any kind of plants like vegetable plants, old flowers, bedded animal manure such as this uh, straw with the with 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 the with the dog or with the horse too. Okay, uh, those are all balanced and can be composted on its own. So. This chart that I'm showing you here is probably the most important chart I'm going to show you tonight, which is a range of materials on the left are materials that are highly brown, uh, materials that decompose very slowly. And we have on the right the green materials, which can compost quickly. But if, if you try to compost manure or grass cuttings or food on their own, you're going to get a slimy, stinky mess. So in the middle is what I call the composting sweet spot. And in this sweet spot, we've got hedge climbing, trimmings, uh, bush trimmings, old plants, weeds, okay? Any kind of whole plant is got, are well balanced and those can be composted as is, all right? All you need to do is chop them up and get them wet. Now, when we're composting food scraps or grass cuttings on the right, that's when we have to be conscious of green and brown and mixing. All right, so if we're gonna do food scraps, we wanna start our composter with some garden materials, and then we can add the food scraps and mix them in with the, with the materials that are within the bin. Likewise, if we're doing grass cuttings, if we do them on their own, they're just gonna get uh, compressed and they're gonna get gooey and they're gonna get stinky. So in the summertime, we can mix them 50-50 with hedge and bush trimmings, okay? Or we can mix them with the combination of, of bush trimmings, old weeds and, and plants, okay? And so again, 50-50 or maybe two thirds of those other materials and one third grass cuttings, and then we can get that into the composter and it should go nice uh, uh, and make a good compost. But the other easy thing to do if, if you are gonna collect the grass cuttings is to mix them 50-50 with leaves. So half, half grass, half leaves, and that gives you a lovely combination for making a perfect hot pile and lots of compost. But you're gonna ask, and I'm gonna answer later, how do we do that when the leaves come in the autumn and in the winter and, this, and the grass cuttings come in the spring and the summer? So we're gonna have you wait and I'll tell you in just a minute. Okay, so as I said earlier, the uh, composting bacteria work from the surface inward. All right, so the smaller the particles, the faster they're gonna decay. And I gave you the example of the block of ice in the sun. So um, again, the more surface area we have, the faster the materials will decay, the faster we're gonna make compost. We can do this by chopping things up by hand uh, with pruning shears uh, or secateurs, as you call them here. Or we can use a, a machete or a shovel and chop them up. There's these little, little um, electric uh, shredders uh, that all can be used, or a lawnmower that can be used to cut things up. But I always say to people that composting starts when you garden. So as you garden, chop things up with your secateurs. That's one of my favorite composting tools, okay? 
And this is important because if you do your gardening for a whole weekend and you don't chop things up, all of a sudden you're up at Sunday dinner time and there's a big pile of unchopped up material. If you put that in the compost bin, there's, there's gonna to be too much air and those materials are gonna dry out. So the, th the trick really is, is to chop things up into six to eight inch pieces, okay? So we take that long bits of, of plant that are growing like a sunflower or maybe a tomato plant, right? And we're gonna chop them up as we pull them out of the garden and we can put them into a bucket or, or a plastic box or whatever you're using, all right, or a can. All right, so that's important. Okay, the next thing really, and this is what most people miss, is getting the moisture level right in the compost pile. As we can see in one of our trainings here in Limerick, is that we have a nice mix of materials and we're actually mixing and watering the materials before they go into the bin. So what I said to you before is that the composting organisms live in the film of moisture that surrounds each particle. So without that moisture, composting won't happen. So you want it wet as a wrung out sponge, wet to the touch. You want to see that the materials look wet and sheeny. You don't want to over soak it. And this is why I like to mix in water outside the compost bin because any extra water will drain off the materials and into the ground. If the pile is, is, is wet or, or dry, uh, and you go back to it and it's very dry, then you can always add water and mix the materials. Okay, so when your materials are being turned. Okay. This is probably the second most important picture I'm going to show you tonight, which shows you sort of the composting particles on a particle basis. And as we see three particles here, uh, we see the film of moisture that surrounds each particle, and that's where the composting organisms or bacteria live. Without that film, there is no composting, okay? And if we put too much water in, or we put ashes in or whatever, it fills up the holes uh, or spaces between the particles and the, the system can go anaerobic, which means it excludes oxygen and we start creating a little bit of an odor, okay? And, and, and it slows the whole process down. Now, aeration is, again, one of the main essentials of composting. And if we make a big batch all at once and it heats up, the air will get sucked into the pile. But also, if we use a variety of composting materials, such as stalks and plants and a little bit of twigs and other leaves and other things, this will create air spaces in the pile. And the pile will naturally sort of draw in oxygen and air and keep it aerobic. So this allows the pile to breathe. We can raise the pile up off the ground to help facilitate this passive aeration. And we can also turn the pile to introduce air into a large pile. Now here we see a nice mixture of, 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 of leaves with some grass in the, in the autumn. Here we built a pile there and then a, a week to 10 days later the pile was turned into the next bay and it was that helped to speed things up. Okay, so how do you know when the compost is finished? Well, we use our senses because this doesn't have to be complicated. If it looks good, where you have a, a uniform dark color and you can no longer recognize the materials that went into the pile, it looks ready. If it smells good in terms of having a nice earthy soil-like smell and you don't smell ammonia or anything putrid or stinky, it smells ready. And if it's friable and loose, then it feels ready. So if it looks ready, smells good, and feels friable and breaks up, then the compost is ready. Okay? That's as easy as that. So the summary of our essentials tonight is a good mix of green and brown materials. Again, a lot of materials are well balanced as they are. As long if we're trying to do food or grass, then we need to draw that mix the, the, the high nitrogen with the with the with the brown materials. We add moisture, make sure there's sufficient moisture. We make sure that the pile has good structure to promote aeration. We give it time, we're gonna make compost. It's a very forgiving process. All right, so we're gonna shift gears here and we're gonna to start to talk about the different systems. And keep in mind the essentials as we go through these systems because they apply to each and every one in a different way, all right? 
So the first two systems we're going to cover are for garden and landscape materials, and you can add food to them. The mulching is most appropriate for woody materials, such as large prunings that you get from trees or large bushes. And wormeries are very good at handling food from the kitchen. Again, vegetarian system here, folks, no meat or bones or fish skins, okay? And I'm gonna talk about each and every one of these right now. The difference between the holding and the turning systems is that the holding systems are a cold and slow process. They're a continuous system where we add materials to the bin as we generate them in the garden. Whereas the turning systems is a hotter and faster compost where we can make compost in six to 12 weeks versus six to 24 months, okay? And we make a big batch all at once. It's like baking a cake. We mix the ingredients, put it in the pan, stick it in the oven, and voila, out comes the finished product. And here it's the same thing. We make a big batch all at once. We turn it from one bin to the next, and voila, within 8, 10, 12 weeks, we can make a lovely compost that we can use in the garden. All right? So the advantage of the holding units are they're, they're the simplest and the least labor intensive. Now I'm a lazy gardener and a lazy composter. So I like to use these holding systems. I make a pile, I let it sit, I let nature do its thing. Sometimes I'll add some worms to it because the worms will do the work for me, of turning it and, and, and digesting the, the materials. And, um, oh, and I just am patient and let the compost uh, come. So for anything I generate in one year is compost for next year, okay? The bins are portable, they can move as where they're needed, so you can place them in different areas of the garden, especially if you have a large large yard or a large little farm, or you can put them in places where, where you're generating the materials. And they're flexible because you can have one system or two or three, all right? Uh, and some, some of these systems, like the, the plastic units, are very good at excluding uh, pests and retaining moisture. Uh, some of the units have lids, or covers to prevent rain from soaking the pile in, in the winter months. And so that's good. But as I said to you earlier in GrangeCon earlier today, the, the covered bins actually kept the water out and the bins dried out because they were sitting in the sun. Now the disadvantages of the holding units are they're a slow method that usually takes six to 24 months depending on the materials you're using. They're open piles and they can become too wet if uncovered, especially in the wet winter months that we have here in Ireland. And the cooler temperatures may not fully destroy weed seeds and plant diseases. So that is something, again, you got to be very conscious of what goes into the pile uh, because you don't get the heat that you do in the turning system to kill weed seeds and diseases. Now, the most simple way of doing these holding systems is just to find a little piece of property and pile the stuff up. Okay, here's somebody doing a no-no. They're just doing grass clippings, but eventually that will turn into compost. Give it three, four years, and that will turn into a lovely compost. But we also can make bins, and the bins are only there to help organize and hold the materials in place. One of my favorite composters is roping four pallets together. Now, you can also use cable ties. It's a good way to keep it all tight. Uh, Another system here is using some sort of coated uh, fencing. Uh, and, and this is sort of a, a, a pentagon uh, shape uh, bin. We can use uh, fencing and make a circle and make a leaf mold cage. These are ideal for leaf mold. Uh, here's a system someone invented using little st um, steel rods and then, and then putting sort of uh, pieces of wood that have holes drilled in them every other. So you get this nice little Lincoln log type effect. Okay, um, here's some homemade systems. One homemade system to the left here of just a compost box, all right, made of uh, different stacks of layers of, of wood there. Uh, the one to the right is a, is a system made by a company called Irish Timber Products in, in Westmead, and they're Athboy, and those, those are lovely. Uh, made out of larch, it's a, it's a rot-resistant wood. It lasts about five, six years. Um, you can get fancy, make it out of two by fours and, and, and hardware cloth. And, and you have a little um, hook and eye and, and hinges to, to sort of take it apart and reassemble it quickly. Um, and there's many plastic bins available. And this one, this one's made of recycled plastic, right? And then there's the ones that here that have been distributed by a lot of the councils uh, from in Ireland. 
a nice large composter here that was distributed by a lot of the county councils uh, back in the day. Now, they did pass these bins out and people generally just took food from the kitchen and filled them up. And then they got a fly ranch and a stinky mess and they wondered, oh, how does this compost work? Well, you go back to the essentials and realize that you can't compost food on its own unless it goes into a wormery or something of that nature, which I'm gonna explain later. Okay, so where do we put these bins? As I said to you earlier, uh, if you put the bin in the sun, it's gonna dry out, okay? And it's gonna be more difficult to manage. It's also good if we can actually place the, the bin on soil so that some of the organisms from the, from, the, from the soil can come up into the bin like the worms and other insects that are helpful in breaking things down. You wanna choose an area where you can easily get to it and add materials and get the compost out. Um, if you are doing a one bin system, sometimes it's good to have a space right next to the bin so that you can take the bin apart, reassemble it, and then toss the compost in and harvest the compost at the bottom, okay? All right, so the steps for setting up uh, and operating these holding systems is that basically you add materials as they're generated. So what I like to suggest to people is that as you garden, you're chopping things up with your secateurs then you basically put them on the ground in front of the compost bin, okay? And then, um, and, and if you're going to uh, compost grass clippings, be sure to add other materials to break them up. Mix and mo moisten with the pitchfork or spading fork. Once they're thoroughly mixed and you've got enough material, again, wet as a wrung out sponge or wet to the touch, then you can add them to the bin. The next time you do this, you just repeat these steps, but before adding new materials, Use a pitchfork to mix and to sort of touch and feel the compost that's in the bin. If it's been like a dry summer we've had in July, the materials may have dried out a little bit and you may need to moisten them. And so sprinkle it with water, mix a little bit, and then add the materials on top. If we're going to add food scraps to one of these holding bins, Again, the important thing here is to start the compost bin with the mixture of garden materials and fill it at least a third full. And then, and then you garden and then you will chop and mix and water the materials in front of the bin. And before you add it to the bin, you can get your kitchen caddy from the house and you can add it to the, to the compost bin. So open the lid, add the food inside, right? Use your pitchfork or spading fork to mix the food in with the materials that are in the bin, okay? And then place the fresh mixed and moistened garden materials on top. The, the thing we want always do is to always bury the food within the materials in the compost bin. We want to bury the food in the soil, bury the food in the wormery, all right? This prevents odors, it keeps the flies down, and actually hides the materials from any sort of uh, four-legged critters, okay? All right, here's what you all have been waiting for, is how do we compost grass cuttings? Now, we know that grass cuttings are generated in the, in the spring and summer months, and the brown materials are generated in the autumn and winter. So what do we do? Well, folks, the smart gardener actually makes a leaf mold cage and stores up the leaves from the autumn, which we can do in a couple months time, into a cage, so that the following year, we have those brown materials to mix with our grass, okay? So there's your answer, all right? So we get the grass, we can put it on the pile, we can mix in the leaves, and then you got a good balance and you, and you break up that grass and you can make a nice compost, okay? Okay, now, um, on some of these holding bins, we can add the materials into the top and harvest out the bottom. Now, it isn't really as easy as they tell you it's going to be, I'm sorry to say. But if you do a good job of mixing and chopping and watering and fluffing up the materials that are in the bin, then you can get materials out of the bottom. Sometimes they will kind of bind up. You'll be able to get a little bit out of the bottom, but then it doesn't sink down. All right, but you can, can do it this way. Now, another way to harvest the bin is that, again, as you're adding materials to the bin, you'll see that the fresh stuff is up at the top and the finished stuff is down at the bottom. 
So how do you get the stuff out of there? Well, what I suggest is take the bin apart, you set it up in a, in a location close by, and then you fork off the stuff from the top that's undecomposed until you get to the finished compost, which I told you, it looks good, smells good, feels good. That's how you can tell where it is. There will be compost at the bottom of that pile. And this is a good way then to restart your compost so that you can, if you wanted to, you can add food on into it because you've got some materials already in the bin. Now, in some cases, if it takes you one to four months to fill the holding unit, it's not gonna be ready because it takes almost a year to make compost in one of these holding systems. So if you're filling the bin in one to four months, you're gonna need another bin so that you can fill the one bin, let it compost while you're filling the other, and then probably by the time you finish filling up the second bin, you let them sit over winter, and then in the springtime, you're ready to harvest the materials out of the first bin and fill it up again, okay? Okay, so um, what are ways that we can speed up the composting using the holding bins? Because this is the most common system used in Ireland are these holding bins. As I said earlier, if we chop things up, we have more surface area, it's easier to mix and get them moist and that's gonna help make things go a little faster. So mixing and moistening the materials before placing them in the bin is a good way to get things rolling. Make sure that you have adequate moisture levels so don't let it dry out. And also make sure that it doesn't get too wet. So these plastic bins with the cover are a good way to keep the moisture out of the compost in the winter months. We can always put a piece of plywood over the pallet bin. We can put carpet or, or a plastic tarp over any open pile in the winter months to keep the extra moisture out, all right? So those are all good ways to control the moisture. And then the third, or the last thing really, is if you turn the pile, it will help you speed the process up and by turning the pile, we have an opportunity to see how the entire pile is doing. There could be nice and moist and, and lovely on the top, but it could be all dry at the bottom. So if we turn the pile, we have an opportunity to add moisture when it's a little dry. Now, if you turn the pile once in, in a garden season, that's gonna help. That's gonna really help to sort of um, produce a better quality compost and get it to go faster so it's ready to go next year, okay? But folks, you don't need to turn it, all right? So the message is you don't have to turn the compost to make compost. It's just gonna take longer, okay? All right, here's a, a little quickie on leaf mold. Uh, this is the most simple way to make compost. We can, we can gather leaves in a big cage or, or a pallet bin or just stack them up in a pile. The trick with leaf mold is to stack the leaves up when they're wet, okay? So in those months, again, late October, November, it is rainy here in Ireland and we will have wet leaves. So instead of collecting dry leaves and then uh, going through all the labor of mixing and watering them, pick them up when they're wet and then just throw them into the bin. You, you can do this in late October, fill the bin up, it will sink down in a couple weeks time. And then and at, at the end of the leaf season, which is in late November, early December, you can top up the bin with more leaves and then you let it sit for two years, okay? Now, you can use the leaf mold in one year's time as a mulch, okay? And then the mulch I'm gonna explain is anything put on the surface of the, of the soil. Um, in two years time, you're gonna get a lovely weed-free, beautiful compost. So if you have the patience, uh, wait two years to produce a lovely compost. Now, what you don't wanna do is let the leaves sink down in a year and add new leaves on top, start a new cage and let the leaves in the first cage finish, okay? All right, so that wraps up the, the holding systems and the easy way to compost. I'm gonna talk about turning really quickly so we can move on to the other sections of the presentation here. And uh, the next system that we're gonna discuss are these turning systems where we make a big batch of compost all at once. And these turning systems involve some sort of, of mixing or rotating or turning of materials to help speed the process and to give air into the materials. And we're gonna talk about multi-bin systems, tumblers and spheres all pictured here. Now, the advantage of these systems is we can make compost more quickly. They handle larger volumes of material. And if you make a good batch and you get your mix right and give it enough moisture, 
you're going to get high temperatures that kill off weed seeds and destroys plant diseases. The disadvantages is they're typically more expensive to build or purchase. They take up more space and it requires more time and energy in managing it. But if you are a organic gardener and you want your compost and you want a good high quality compost that has killed the plant diseases and weed seeds, then this is the system for you. But basically one in 10, one in 20 people will do this uh, because it does require more work. And it also with the size of the gardens in Ireland, we typically don't have uh, the quantity of materials to support a big batch all at once. So these systems are good for things like community gardens or for a school or a large property. Um, uh, you know, so, so there are applications for these types of systems. Here's a, a, a three bin system with a lid on it to control moisture. Uh, again, we bas basically build a fresh batch in the, in the bin at the left. Uh, a week to two weeks later, we can turn the compost into the second bin, build a pile in the first bin, and then two, a week to two weeks later, we can turn the materials into the third, third bin to the right, uh, flip the bin stuff from the first bin to the second bin, and build a new pile in the first bin to the left. Okay, so these do work. And again, you got to make a big batch all at once and you can get nice high temperatures of 50, 60, 70 degrees. Now wait, when you're making a batch, you can layer to help you proportion the materials. And so, you know, a four inch layer of leaves, a three to four inch layer of grass cuttings, but you're going to have to mix them thoroughly and add water as you're doing it. Now, I prefer to actually mix the water outside the bin and add it to the bin, but if you're limited with space, you can do that process inside the bin itself. Now, as I said, another way, as I just said, is to mix and water the materials in front of the bin and then place it into a compost system after you've mixed and watered things. Okay, so we can take temperatures and, it, you know, if those, those, those hobby uh, composters can get a little temperature probe to check out the temperature, but you can also use your hand and put your hand in the pile or, or, or you, can, you can take your pitchfork and, and dig a hole in the middle and see if any steam comes out. But uh, the, the temperature tells you that everything is well balanced and on its way and working well. Now, when this temperature starts to, to, to peak and, and starts to decrease, you know you're running out of air in the pile. And that's the time when you turn it. Okay, and what we want to try to do is turn the inside out and the outside in so we can expose all the materials to the heat of, this, of the middle to kill the far fly larvae, the, the diseases, the weed seeds, and all the rest of that. Okay, all right. Now, outside of the turning bins or the multi bin systems, we have these tumblers. Uh, there are people who can make homemade systems like this. It's important to add baffles inside like a dryer that flips and flops the material inside, okay? Um, and, and there's a homemade system. Uh, we have one to the right that's available in Ireland. It, it is an odd shaped sort of barrel that then uh, allows the materials to get flipped around, okay? So those can work well. But the, 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 the trick with these systems is you're gonna leave it into that, uh, uh, into the barrel for a week or two and then you're gonna to have to take it out and let it sit in a pile and, and, and cure and finish, all right? So you just use it for the first couple of weeks, get the system going, and then after things have cooled off, you can empty them. As you see in this picture, there's a little bin to the left and to the right. So that basically you get the stuff going. Uh, these are great for you doing food and garden materials. Um, and then basically you empty the material on the ground and fork off the materials and put them into one of the bins and let it sit for a month or two, all right? Okay, this is the new kit on the block called the BioOrb. It's, I think, kind of, uh, I'm gonna be frank with you, I think it's kind of a joke, but it is there and I just wanted to show you what people are going to try to sell you guys that don't know what you're doing. But yeah, you're supposed to fill this up and roll it around. Uh, how long it will last? I don't know, but yeah. This is one way to do it, is, uh, is to fill up your orb and, and, and roll it around the lawn. But it's just for fun there, folks. Okay, the next system I want to talk about is mulching, all right? And mulch is anything we apply to the surface of the soil to protect the soil from erosion and compaction. 
It helps conserve moisture within the soil, especially during dry months like we had in July. It inhibits weed growth and it protects uh, plants from extreme weather extremes, especially in the winter when we're getting cold and or a lot of rain. Now mulches can be made out of all different kinds of materials. We've seen people use rocks, uh, plastic, uh, cardboard, you name it. But I like to use uh, make mulch out of, uh, of landscape materials. So uh, we can use uh, sticks, um, pine cones, leaves, pine needles, paper, uh, um, all kinds of all kinds of goodies, right? So here's here's different different materials we can make mulch from. Okay, uh, we can use the shredders. Um, these are time consuming and a little fussy. Um, as I said, sometimes when I'm doing some trimming of the bushes, I can cut the fresh leafy parts off and compost it. And if I've got anything that's larger than my little finger, the diameter of my little finger, I use my secateurs to cut up one to two inch sections and I can make a little, little bucket of mulch for it and use it around the garden, around in a perennial area. Now, we can also, again, uh, chop things by hand, use a mower. Um, there's the, the larger um, petrol fuel machines that actually uh, cut things up a little quicker. Those, those work well. Uh, I suggest you rent those rather than buy one, okay, uh, to chop things up if you want to. But that's my favorite system right there. Get the tree surgeon in, have them chop up, your, your, your tree trimmings and your bush trimmings, and then ask them to leave the chips at, at, at your property so you can use them around the garden. Okay, and this is what you get. I think this is as nice as beauty bark, okay? And the one thing I love about this is that as you put it around the perennial areas of the garden, it starts to promote some biodiversity of insects and grubs and worms and all that, and that attracts the birds. And the birds come in, and they're they're scratching along, and they're having a good good meal. So this is a lovely way to create some biodiversity in your garden. Okay, we can use mulch as, in a variety of ways as a path material in annual planting beds and perennial planting areas around trees and shrubs as a winter cover and for erosion control. So I'm going to show you just some quick pictures on these. But if we're going to use it as a path material, cut away the, the area that you want to use as a path. Uh, a lot of times I like to put a layer of cardboard down because the cardboard will block the weeds for a year or two and then break down so you don't have any plastic in the soil. That uh, weed cloth usually just comes popping up anyway and gets ugly. Uh, and then each year replenish the, 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 the chips on top. Okay, so let's see how nice that looks. Lovely. Very nice. And we can use it in, in annual areas. So what I, for annual areas, I like to use what I call a soft mulch. So half finished compost or partially finished compost. Uh, Unsieved compost is a great for mulch. You can put it on the annual areas during a, one season in the summer and in the autumn. And the following year, you can just dig it into the soil. Okay, so you can use grass cuttings uh, as another thing, but keep it thin and keep it away from the plant stems. One year I put the grass around my tomato plants and it got so hot that the tomato plants keeled over because the, the grass rotted the stems. So keep it away from the stems, all right? Now we can also use the mulch and I like harder mulches around on my perennials, okay? So here we're, we're planting a, a, a pollinator garden down in Cork and we're putting in two, three, four inches of, of the wood chip around the plants that we just put into the soil after we added compost in the soil to help the plants. But the, uh, once we've cleared the area of weeds and planted them, then we put this mulch down and it does keep the weeds down and it does hold the moisture in the soil so there's less work going forward, okay? And for plant, perennial planting areas, I like to put two to six inches. Again, the smaller the plant, the, 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 the shallower, the, the application of mulch spread evenly over the area, keep it away from plant stems, okay? And pine needles and leaves make a good mulch for acid loving plants such as rhododendrons, uh, lilies of the valley, blueberries, raspberries, they, they, they like a slightly acidic soil, all right? Okay, so here's again, picture of Kilkenny Castle and they're using the mulch in their rose gardens. Look how beautiful that is. The nice thing is that as the mulch decays, 
of the worms in the soil start to bring that organic matter back into the soil. As it rains, it starts to bring nutrients down into the root zone. And so it's a it's a win-win situation for everyone and there's less work. Um, one of the things that's important is you can use the mulch around planted trees. Again, the roots extend to the to the uh, area of where the leaves have come out on the tree. We call that the drip line. All right, so what we want to do is get a nice mulch there so that when the, when the tree is, is watered, that the water actually gets to the tree roots instead of feeding the grass. This also keeps the grass away from the, uh, the roots as well so that any nutrients from the mulch then can go down into the roots and be absorbed by the tree. Uh, a lot of times people plant trees and then all of a sudden there's just weeds or grass that surrounds the area and it's competing with the tree for those essential moisture and nutrients. So uh, get the mulch out there. It's a good, good way to promote healthy tree growth. And the one thing here in, in Ireland, I have a hard time understanding because I work with a lot of allotments. As I go to the allotment, they're great at gardening, great community, lots of crack. And, but then in the winter time, everybody goes home and they leave their beds bare. They maybe pull the plants out, but they leave it bare. And then the next spring they come along and their, their beds are full of weeds. And there's a lot of work. And then there's a lot of good soil that's being uh, taken with the weeds when they weed it. And it's a lot of work. So why not cover your beds over winter with a good thick layer of leaves or a nice uh, layer of hay, as you can see here, and then the following spring, all you do is just rake that hay up, add it to the compost pile, and voila, you're just about ready to plant. So it's a, it's a good little trick using that. And again, the, the mulch can be used on slopes to, to stabilize the soil to keep it from being eroded. Again, same application that I talked to you before, uh, and, and, and does help us establish these plants on a, a sloping surface. Okay. That takes care of mulching, folks. And now what we're gonna do is talk about wormeries. Okay, so what, what, what type of food is suitable for home composting? Uh, due to potential problems, odors and pests, we only recommend vegetable or plant-based food scraps to be composted at home. So all the things you see on the left, vegetable trimmings, fruit peels, spoiled fruit, coffee grounds, tea bags, any kind of bread, pasta, crackers, cakes, cooked cereal, what have you and it can be cooked or uncooked. The dividing line for us isn't cooked or uncooked, it's between plant-derived materials and animal-derived materials. We, so there are no fish or meat of any kind, cooked raw or any, anything, no fat, no bones, no skin, no guts, no cooking oils or grease or dairy products, eggshells, eggs, soups, sauces with meat or fish, okay? Folks, we are looking at a vegetarian diet, all right? That's what it looks like, and that's what we can compost easily at home, without any problems. Now I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna get a question on eggshells, so I'm, I'm ready for that later. What we can do is collect this material in the kitchen. And I think the important thing is actually to have a cover for your collection bin so that you prevent the flies from laying eggs into your food scraps that then you can put in either to your wormery or your compost bin. So keep it covered and then you can uh, take it out and feed the worms or, or feed a larger bucket um, for uh, adding to your wormery or your compost bin. Now worms are nature's best composters. All right, folks, I have a picture there of a worm with some of their egg, egg uh, uh, casings, all right, their cocoons, all right? And the important thing to know here, there's two things. One is there's really two types of worms. There are worms that live in the soil, those are the night crawlers or the big grayer type worms that like to live in the soil. And as they eat the soil or it passes through their gut, the, the grinding of the, the minerals in their gut breaks open any of the single celled organisms or mold or any of the other critters that are in the soil. And that's how they get their food. The other type of worms that I'm most interested in are called red worms and they like to live on the surface and they're surface feeders and they don't live in the soil, they live above the soil. So they live in the, in the, in the, in the grassy area on top in cow piles. Uh, they live in leaf mold piles, they live in compost bins, all right? 
And the second thing that's most important is that both worms, the earthworm or the redworm, they breathe through their skin, all right? So we need to maintain a dark and moist environment for them to thrive and survive. But worms are, once you get your wormery set up, this is the best way to make the, the richest, most beautiful compost you can imagine. The worm castings, which is just worm doo-doo, is an aphrodisiac for plants. They absolutely go crazy for it. So it is, uh, as you know, a, a, a field that's rich in earthworms also is very fertile. It does create good drainage. Uh, the worm dew is magical for your plants and you don't need a lot of it, but it is a, a, a great, a great a compost. Now you can get these stackable systems to the right here. They're a little fussy um, and they do sort of, they can get too wet because uh, the top has a, um, holes on it, which allows it to breathe, but also allows rain in. I prefer the, the compost boxes um, that you can do as a wormery. And we're gonna show you how to set that up right now. Basically what you wanna do is you wanna create a, a, a bedding material for the wormery, okay? Um, and that can be a mix of leaves and shredded paper, all right? And the leaves provide nutrients and the paper hold moisture. But we're gonna to need to uh, shred it up. We're gonna to need to soak it, okay? And then we can add it to the bin. And once we have the bin filled with bedding, then we can start to add the food scraps. All right? All right. So uh, once you get the wormery established, then you can start adding a, a trench of food scraps every week like this. And you basically dig a trench, you add the food scraps, mix it with the materials that are underneath, and then you cover over with the bedding you remove to the left. Okay, now I like to put a layer of newspaper on top because if the paper is wet when you open the bin, the bedding is wet enough. If the paper dries out, then the bedding is too dry and you're gonna need to get a watering can and give it a little water. Okay, so that covers wormeries and if anyone's interested in a, in a flyer to, to, to set up a wormery, let Sinead know and I can send out a, a specific flyer for the wormeries that gives you more information. Now we're wrapping it up here. I got about five more minutes or so uh, and we're gonna go over what kind of bin uh, system is most appropriate for you at home. And it really depends on the type of material you have. If you've got a lot of woody materials, uh, you're gonna wanna chop things up and use it as a mulch. If you've got a lot of grass, I would encourage you to consider grass cycling where you cut the grass and leave it on the lawn. All the golf courses and parks and public areas are cutting and leaving the grass. Now the trick here with grass cycling is not to let the grass grow too long because if the grass gets too high, it grows stem and stem doesn't degrade as quickly as leaf. So let the grass go grow four to five inches and cut off an inch, inch and a half and just let it compost in place. If you got a lot of leaves, leaf mold cages. As I said to you earlier, very easy, simple way to make a lovely weed-free compost. If you've got a mix of materials, then a compost system, a holding system probably would be the best system for you. You can always use a combination of systems um, if you've got a variety of materials. So you could have a worm ring for food, you can have a, a leaf mold bin for, for the leaves and you can cut it and leave it for the grass and now you've got everything sorted. Now, it also depends on the quantity of materials. If you've got a lot, then maybe a turning system would work. Or you can do uh, uh, several of the holding systems. If you've got a lot of space and you want the compost more quickly, you want a higher quality compost, you're gonna then want a turning system. If you really just wanna manage it and produce compost uh, on a year to year basis, then a little holding bin is gonna be fine for you, okay? Okay, so how can we use compost? This is the last little bit that I'm gonna talk about. There's five ways to use compost. We can use it as a mulch, which I kind of covered a little bit earlier. We can use it as a soil amendment. We can use it as an ingredient in a potting soil or a seed starting mix, and we can leave it, leave it to the British. We're gonna make some compost tea. All right, so uh, as a, using it as a mulch, as I said earlier, this protects roots, it releases nutrients as it de degrades and decays. <clears throat> it conserves soil moisture and inhibits weeds. It can prevent erosion. And over time, it builds soil and improves soil quality. 
again, we showed you this picture. Uh, I can use uh, uh, the compost that's uh, unsibbed as a mulch, okay? And the plants just love it. They absolutely look how healthy and lovely those plants look. In the following spring, I can just use any leftover on the top and dig it into the soil, and then I can plant my plants back in. And once they grow a little bit, then I can add a little more mulch, and that's sort of a little annual cycle. There you go. Doesn't that look lovely? Um, we can use a, a compost, finished compost around trees or perennial plantings as well. Um, here in both perennial and annual areas, again, uh, it's all perfectly lovely. Now, the biggest benefit of compost is using it as a soil amendment, which means we're going to get it into the soil, into the garden uh, soil before we plant plants, okay? Um, and the reason that compost is so lovely is it provides both macro and micronutrients. Your, your chemical fertilizers are only going to give you nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. The compost is going to give you all those micronutrients to keep the plants healthy. Boron, iron, magnesium, calcium, all those lovely micronutrients. It's like a vitamin pill, okay? Um, it supplies valuable organic matter into the soil. And what you're really doing with compost is feeding the ecosystem of life in the soil. And as they break it down further, they can actually release nutrients that the plants can absorb easily. It improves drainage and moisture penetration in heavy soils. It helps you improve nutrient and, and moisture holding capacity in light or sandy soils. It helps prevent soil compaction and erosion. It buffers the soil's acidity so that you get improved nutrient availability. This is just a fancy way of saying that if your soil is pH neutral or a little higher, the nutrients move more easily from the soil into plant roots. All right, it increases crop yields and it helps suppress plant diseases because your, your plants are getting a nice diet of nutrients, both macro and micronutrients. So the compost is magic. And what we're starting, starting to understand in soil science is that plants just don't suck up nutrients that are in the soil. There are organisms in the soil and we're talking about many, many hundreds of thousands of different types of organisms. There's bacteria, there's fungus, there's all kinds of different organisms in the soil that are helping plant roots uh, extract and absorb uh, plant nutrients. As we can see on the right, there is a, uh, is a fungus that actually sucks sugar out of the plant root in exchange for giving the plant uh, phosphorus, potassium. There's bacteria, nitrogen fixing bacteria that actually draw nitrogen out of the soil, out of the air, and helps the plant absorb nitrogen. So there's these complex synergies between the soil and plants and the plant roots to help get those nutrients into the plant and help you grow a beautiful, healthy plant. And compost is the answer, is the solution, is the elixir for growing lovely, beautiful plants. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to add three to 10 centimeters of compost on top of our garden beds. We're going to fork it in or use a rototiller, okay, to get it into the soil. This is my home in Seattle uh, many, many years ago before I moved to, to Ireland. Uh, we spread out the compost. Uh, we added the organic fertilizers uh, and we added a little lime because we have acidic soils there. We used a, a, a rototiller to mix it in. Uh, we spread the seeds, raked it in, watered it, and I tell you, that grass was good for 10 years without even any fertilizing. It was absolutely gorgeous. The compost made it all happen. We can add, add compost to soil before we put sod on it and use the compost between the pieces of sod to fill in the holes so it, it, it actually establishes more quickly. The compost holds the moisture near the surface of the soil so the roots go in quicker. Okay, we can use compost as a way to plant trees and shrubs, dig the hole, add the compost into the hole, mix it with the soil inside, then mix the compost into the soil that's been taken out of the hole and then cover up uh, your roots and you finish your planting. Now, this is magical stuff. As you can see, compost works wonders and it is a, 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 a tonic. It is an elixir. It is everything that the soil needs. So the bottom line here, folks, is healthy soil equals healthy plants. And compost is the foundation for building healthy soil. All right, 
Um, let's go quickly now to potting soils and seed starting mixes. You want to sieve the compost, okay? That's very important for both seed starting mixes and potting soils. For potting soil, we're going to use two thirds garden soil and one third compost, okay? Lovely, this picture is down in Limerick. The Limerick Park system uses uh, compost with their soil, makes these beautiful plants they put around the city, okay? Here again in Limerick, they're using compost as a, as a seed starting mix, half compost, sieved of course, half sand, all right? And then compost tea. We can do nettle tea, comfrey tea, compost tea, manure tea. Uh, you basically, you get a sack, you put the compost or the nettles or the manure or, or the compost in it, you soak it for two to three days, and then you get the water out of the barrel, and then you use it uh, to irrigate the plants. Now, folks, you don't drink this tea. This tea, this is a tea for plants, okay? But it provides valuable nutrients and, and, and a lot of microbes to, 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 to inoculate the soil with beneficial organisms, and it does help suppress diseases. All right, now we're coming down to the last slides here. I promised that before, but I'm serious now. Uh, we're doing a little comparison of peat versus compost. Now, as Nula explained, and she's absolutely right, is that um, peat takes hundreds, even thousands of years to make. There, it's produced in a, an environment where there's very little decay. All right, so you're getting a, 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 a compost that is fairly acidic. It is nutrient-less. There are no nutrients in peat at all, okay? There's no life in it because it's been basically living in water, all right? And it does hold water well. It does have high organic matter, which if, you're, if your soil is short on organic matter, it does help in that regard, okay? But it also is high in carbon. So when you add the peat to the soil, it draws nitrogen from the soil to break down. So it's actually competing with your plants for that essential nutrient. Compost is different. Compost contains uh, uh, one to two percent nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but also has all those micronutrients that are essential for healthy plant growth and disease suppression. Compost is pH neutral, which helps to uh, the, the nutrient availability within the soil. As I said earlier, if the pH is neutral or higher, then it's more easy for the, for the nutrients to move from the soil into the plant root. Peat is acidic it's gonna inhibit that transfer, okay? Now compost also is full of life. All the microbes, all the fungus, all the lovely soil organisms and life, it invigorates the ecosystem in the soil. It's also low in carbon so that when the compost further breaks down, that nitrogen is available for uptake by plants, okay? And it does uh, hold moisture, not as well as the peat, but it does hold moisture. Um, and in terms of moisture holding capacity. And because the, the particle size is different uh, and varies with compost, it does open up the soil structure and, and it can, it can improve uh, drainage and aeration within the soil. So compost it, overall, folks, is a way better soil amendment than, than peat moss. Peat moss is, requires you to add chemical fertilizers and that can add cost and, and as you know, can harm the environment. All right, troubleshooting really quick, and this is it, uh, is that sort of, uh, we're gonna address some of the problems here. And, 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 and if we have a problem, we wanna answer the following questions. What sort of system are you using? What types of materials were used to make the pile? Very important. How old is it? Is it wet or dry? Again, yes, today, the stuff was so dry, it couldn't compost. What does it look like? Have you poked around inside to check, check it for odors for, for moisture level? Um, are there flies or rats? And I know I'm gonna deal with the rat question at the, at the end. Um, here's our troubleshooting guide. If the a pile has a foul odor, it either is uh, made with like grass clippings or too much food, there's not enough air. Um, so this, 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 this can create the, the problem. Um, the solutions are to turn it and, and balance the pile out, okay? Limit your food scraps to the only ones that come from plants. Uh, if there's clumps of slimy grass and a sharp ammonia smell, it means you're probably may having a too rich of a diet with the grass cuttings. We can either do the grass cycling to keep the compost, the grass clippings out of the compost system or mix in uh, some brown materials uh, 
and, and remember that you want a nice 50-50 mix of the grass clippings with any other material. If the, bio, the pile is too dry, it's not gonna do anything. What we did today in GrangeCon is we did brought all five contents from these bins and we mixed and watered them and then just placed it all back into one bin and, and got it and, and we'll let it sit and, and compost over the winter, okay? The pile is damp and woody and not composting. Probably there's just the, the materials, the, the materials are too big. They need to be chopped up a little more and you need to add some uh, source of green material. Um, if there is a swarm of flies that uh, greet you when you open the lid, well, probably means you're doing a little dump and run, which is you're opening the lid, dumping your food scraps in on the top and holding your nose and putting the lid back on top. Now, the trick here is to try to actually mix your, 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 your food into the materials below and cover it with uh, garden materials on top you need to bury that food scraps or cover the pile with wet newspaper or a plastic sheet just to keep the flies um, at bay. Here's the question about rats. Again, uh, if you put high protein items in the bin, especially if you do a dump and run and leave it on top, it's just an invitation for our little furry friends. If we are actively managing the pile, the, the rats are more scared of us than we are of them. They will not uh, bother you, especially during the winter months when they might want to um, nest into a dry and, and a pile that's not being managed at all. Uh, they will then make themselves at home. Um, if the pile doesn't heat up, we're either not um, creating the critical mass I talked about earlier. It might be too dry. There might be too much uh, high brown materials such as uh, the, the twigs and the sticks or the sawdust or the hay. And there's not enough green material. And so we might want to chop things up and add some green material or moisten things uh, to get them all sorted and get them going. Last but not least, sometimes we have a compost pile and it looks kind of like there's nothing going on. But if we peel away the top, it's there'll be finished compost underneath. So again, it's worthwhile to kind of poke around, use your senses, again, the, sight of, the senses of sight, smell, and, and touch to sort of check out and see how the pile is doing. So folks, uh, that's it. I appreciate your attention. I'm sorry for going over a little bit, but let's take the questions now from you all. Thanks, Craig. That was certainly a marathon for you. So I'll give you a breather while we look at these questions. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for your participation in the chat. We've got some, some good ones that I think a lot of people will appreciate. Uh, first, Craig, I just there's a few uh, different materials people have questions on. Okay. So we have coffee grinds, uh, kitchen paper that might have some oil or something that you've used in cooking on it, and the ash from a wood-only fire. Okay, so let's take the coffee grounds. Coffee grounds are, are a great material for composting. The worms absolutely love coffee grounds, okay? Um, so they can, again, when we're, when we're making a pile, if we have a lot of coffee grounds, we just need to mix them with everything and, and add it to the pile. Um, the second question was a little bit of, tiny bit of oil on a little napkin. I wouldn't worry about it too much, but if it's well soaked with oil, or you're trying to soak up a nice, a lot of chicken fat or whatever, keep it out. Uh, the last question was, um, remind me, please. Uh, ash from ash, a wood only fire. Wood only fire. Again, as I said, if you have a cup of it, fine, put it in. But if you got a bucket of it, no. Keep it separate. Keep it in your garage or in a storage area, and then you can use it directly on the soil when you're when it's time for mixing and compost and, and, and adding it directly to the soil, especially if your soil is acidic. If your soil is alkaline, then you're not going to want to add the wood ash to your, to your soil. So do a little simple soil test and see where the acidity level is of the soil. Great. Um, somebody also asked if about the plastic bin they have that has a huge population of red worms okay. and they said are there any tips for separating the worms from the compost so they can put them back in the bin okay um very good question uh i'd say congratulations first where there are red, red red worms in your composter you're doing something right and the compost is going to be a lovely quality 
So that's number one. Number two, how do we separate the worms from the compost? Worms don't like light. So if we basically put the compost onto a tarp and create a little mountain, and then basically every five, 10, 15, let's say every 10 to 15 minutes, we take an inch away from the top, the surface, the worms dive down into the middle. So what we can do is create a mountain, pull the compost off an inch or two at a time, or at least an inch at a time from that cone. And as the light is exposed, the worms are exposed to light, they will dive down into the center and down to the bottom, and then you're left with a big bunch of worms at the end. Very good. And just on that, um, Mohammed has asked if the worms can be produced in the pile in the compost, or do you always have to add them? Say it again. Are the worms something that come through the composting process, or do you always have to add them? It's amazing that um, either through birds or up through the soil that I find that uh, a lot of times the worms find the, the pile of manure or the, the, the leaf mold bin or the compost bin. We just had, um, it was yesterday, I was up in Balbriggan and there was a woman that gave us two bags of, of well-rotted horse dew and it was chocker full of worms. Now, where do they come from? All right. So a lot of these egg casings can get moved around, right? And, and the little worms, all you need is like eight worms and within a, a month or two, you've got thousands of worms, all right? They will, given the right conditions, they will reproduce and take off, all right? So um, they just seem to magically appear. Now, if you wanna speed things up, like if you had a leaf mold pile, which is not gonna heat up and you wanna actually get nature to, to help you make leaf mold quicker, you can add worms, or if you have uh, access to a farm where there is well composted um, horse dew or cow dew, get some of that with that's loaded with worms and put it and mix it into your leaf mold bin, and all of a sudden the, the worms are going to be happy and they're going to go munch around and, and, and help you digest all those leaves. So you can either add them to the pile, or they will most of the time they will naturally um, um, make themselves at home. Great. And we have a question actually from somebody on Twitter who wasn't able to make it, but really wanted to know about composting in smaller uh, spaces. I suppose she was specifically asking about apartments with no brown bins or some strict balcony rules, or if there was a community composting option that they could take. Um, I generally discourage community composting because uh, now there are great people but a lot of times you can get out of control and what happens is everybody's bringing stuff and nobody's managing it, okay? But we can also make wormeries out of a small plastic bin, like one of those storage bins. So you can, they can be like a foot or a foot and a half by two feet big with a lid on it. So you can make wormeries that are smaller than the one I show in the, in the slideshow. Um, and then, you, you know, a lot of the solutions for folks as they're into gardening is to actually get their own allotment and then they can take their food scraps to the allotment and compost it with their garden materials. So, and, and, and there may be a neighbor that might be into composting and may take, take the material. So there, there, there are several ways to, to, to deal with that, you know. Right. And then we also had um, two more questions about other materials. So pumpkin. Somebody has some pumpkins that they wanted to compost, and other people are also asking again about the eggshells. Oh yeah, eggshells is my favorite. Okay, so pumpkins, pumpkins are going to be composted. They need to be chopped up a little bit. All right, now pumpkin seeds or anything from the squash family loves to grow in compost, in pure compost. So if you leave too many of the pumpkin seeds in the pile they can sprout and grow. All right, now, pumpkin seeds are a lovely thing to eat. You can roast them up in, in the oven and eat them, right? So you might be able to harvest the seeds and then chop up the pumpkins and put them in the compost pile. But that is a very appropriate question because we are in a couple months coming up into Halloween season and we're gonna have a lot of pumpkins. So use a spade, chop it up, um, and it can be added to the compost pile. Try to get as many of the seeds out as you can. Okay, if you're doing a hot pile, the seeds can go in. If you're doing a cool pile, try to keep the seeds out. 
Okay. All right. And the other question? Eggshells. Eggshells. Oh, my favorite. Uh, okay. The eggshells. The eggshells sit right in the middle of that dividing line I was telling you about between animal and plant derived materials. And so a lot of people do put eggshells in. And again, when I was at GrangeCon today, there was a compost bin where somebody was adding food scraps to one of the bins and there was a lot of eggshells and they don't break down. They will be there at the end of the process. One of the, and, and it doesn't hurt really. I mean, it's not gonna hurt anything. And eventually you're gonna add those eggshells back into the soil and it's gonna release calcium, which is an essential micronutrient for plants. One of the things you can do is that when you're roasting a, a, a chicken or, or a leg of lamb, or you're baking something in the oven, you can put the shells in a, in a, in a tray or a cooking pan, and you can bake them at the same time. And that'll help break them up so that you can actually almost get it into a powder form. And then you can collect it into a, like a coffee can or, or a bucket. And then again, when you're adding your compost to the soil and your wood ash, if you've got an acidic soil, you can also then spread your egg, your powdered eggshells. So that's a, a way to deal with eggshells. So I hope that answers the question. Great. And we'll probably just have one more final one. Um, something I think a lot of people probably have this issue. How do you rectify a bad compost bin with lots of flies? Okay, a fly issue. All right, the first thing to do is the flies are there because you're just probably just dumping food waste on the top. Okay, so again, if we put food out in nature, something in nature will reproduce and come and get it. So if we're going to put out peanut butter and, and we're going to put out nice uh, meats and bones and, and skins and stuff, the rats are going to be attracted and they're going to be digging around and going for it or dogs or cats or whatever. The same thing with fruit flies. Fruit flies um, like, you know, fruit and peels and rotted fruits and all that stuff. So if you're going to put it out there, they're going to come and get it. Now, the other day, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, we had let the sort of the, the kitchen bin go a little longer than usual and emptying it. And all of a sudden there's a bunch of maggots in there, all right? And maggots come from blue, uh, uh, blue bottle flies. So uh, again, if you're gonna let that stuff out in nature, there's someone that's gonna come and get it because it's food, all right? So what we have to do is do two things, prevention and cure. So the prevention is really always bury the food waste into your compost system. So don't make that food available or easily available because the flies are not gonna go down into the bin. They, they're surface feeders, okay? The same thing with uh, blue bottles. They're not gonna go more than half an inch or an inch into the compost pile. They are also surface feeders, okay? Now, if you've got a fly problem, the easy solution is to mix up a nice batch of mixed garden materials, wet it and put it on top. If you don't have uh, the garden materials, then put, put a nice wet layer of newspaper on top. Make sure you seal it all around. If you're in a plastic bin, seal it all around the edges, okay? Because that's gonna prevent flies from coming in and it's gonna keep the flies from going out. But my, my suggestion is to mix up the materials all right, and then cover it over with fresh garden materials or leaves or sawdust, okay? And cover it and, and get it so because the flies don't like garden materials. Now, grass clippings is not the one to do because they, they can like that a little bit. But if you've got a good mix of, of, of mixed up and chopped up and moistened garden materials on top, then you're gonna bury those flies in the pile and they're just gonna get composted. Is that okay? Great. And now, very finally, a bit of an unorthodox question from somebody saying that they heard if you peed in your compost bin, it was good for the bacteria. Okay. Wee oui, wee. Oui. Lovely question. All right. Um, urine has a, it's high in nitrogen. Okay. So if you've got, if you're going to be, if you're going to go wee oui, wee oui on a grass pile, not so good because you're adding nitrogen to nitrogen. It's just gonna make that situation worse. But if you've got a leaf mold pile, hey, go for it. It's gonna help the leaves break down quicker. 
or you have a pile that has a good mix of materials and it's a little dry, there's no, the wee wee's gonna help, okay? So no worries about that. I mean, you know, there are a lot of folks that are, that are into uh, working with nature and it is, it, it is a resource that we can use uh, to, 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 to water the pile. Uh, if your pile is real dry, dilute it a little bit so you can moisten the pile and add a little wee wee at the same time. So that's not a worry at all. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Craig, for that really comprehensive um, workshop. I think everyone has a spinning head now trying to figure out what their next steps are, their home composting. So it's very inspiring. Um, and so we're, we're going to close very shortly. We're just going to hand over to our CEO and Antashka Gary, who's going to launch today and I suppose give us a sneak peek of the brilliant compost for nature guide which will also help you on your composting journeys uh, so Gary if you want to pop on there okay good evening everybody um hope you enjoyed this evening uh, I'm delighted this evening to share with you the launch of a brand new compost for nature guide and give you a sneak peek new the guide is packed full of practical information on how to compost and why it's so important to avoid buying peat moss being sold as compost and to protect our peatlands. This guide is part of Antasha's Grow With Us campaign to encourage more people to grow and compost for nature. For many people, gardening and growing have been vital for minding health and well-being during the isolating challenging times of this pandemic. People are also becoming more aware and concerned about extreme weather, events, biodiversity loss due to climate change. Growing and composting are practical actions for people to do their bit for biodiversity and nature. It also gives people a chance to connect more and be mindful of their consumption and waste. We're very thankful for the collaboration with Composting Ireland, Craig Brenton, Nuna Madigan, the artist Barry Reynolds, for his beautiful work and of course our funders the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage who funded this publication to the Peatlands Community Engagement Scheme. We're also grateful to the Heritage Council for funding the dissemination of the guide and our Grow With Us campaign this week during National Heritage Week and beyond. The guide will be full of, fully available from tomorrow morning on our website and on social media channels. Finally, Antashka is a membership organisation. Our advocacy work relies on the financial support of our members. We simply couldn't do the work without our members. We welcome all new members to join and support our work. Get involved in our committees and be part of our community that cares deeply about nature, heritage and sustainability. Thank you. Great, right, thank you, Gary. So as you can see there on the slideshow, the very beautiful artwork by Barry Reynolds, the illustrator of the guide. Um, and it's packed full of information, not just about composting, but the importance of avoiding peat moss in our gardening and horticulture. And so like Gary said, that will be available tomorrow on the website and it will be shared across our social media channels. But we'll make sure to email all of you that have been at the event today so you get, you get the first look. So thank you everybody for your participation and I hope it's uh, been very useful for you and will inspire you, I suppose, to keep composting or spread the word to all your family and friends because all those individual actions, they really do make a difference. So take care and have a good evening. Thank you, folks.